Welcome, everybody. Today, we are talking offshore fishing. Everything you need to know about catching the big ones in the school offshore. Tournament talk and tackle talk, all on this edition of Tackle Shop Live. Day. Right there, you took my breath away. A young and pretty, you was it just a dream? The next day, you called me up. You told me I'm your little buttercup. You came over and you fell into my arms. Well, I know what I feel. Please tell me your love is real. You make me smile when I think of you. What's up? What's up, Joseph? How are you, buddy? Chuck Wright, what's up, Chuck? Hope you got your tackle, buddy. Mike Hayer, how you doing? Terry Clouds, how you doing? Johnny Cop, what's up, Johnny? Man, we got a great show for you. Got some great offshore talk we're going to be doing. Uh, Jeff Brew Baker, how are you doing, man? Thanks a lot, buddy, for tuning in. Emmett Fitzhume, what's up, man? Jeff Riddle, Richard Neighbor, what's up, buddy? Stan Horn, how are you, Stan? Heard you guys had another great tournament down there. Good to hear that. Uh, Dave Schottelmeyer, yeah, what's up, SFP? Thanks, buddy. And there's music, King says. All right. Jason, hi. How are you? Robert Murphy, Todd Albright. And we got a great crew stopping in tonight. All kind of good guys. My name is Mike Acord. This is George Acord. And behind the camera is cameraman Nick. How you doing, Nick? I'm doing good. How's it going, everybody? Yeah, Nick had his... Uh, Free Tackle Shop live talk, and everybody tuned in for that. Greg Plank, how you doing? Brian Moffitt. Yeah, so, man, we got we got a great, great, great show for you tonight. Um, a topic which I love to talk about because we, we love offshore fishing, me and George. So we're going to get into that deep, talk about all the things you need to know to have confidence in fishing off the shore and finding the right structure to catch those schools of fish that post spawn summertime, you know, which we're moving into here where those fish pull off to. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. I know it's uh, tough to do tough to have the confidence. And we're hoping that after this show, you guys have confidence uh, enough to go out there and look around and, and come up with something. <clears throat> it's so, hard. To, it's hard to fish what you can't say. It is. It's, it is. But you know, once you do it with success, it's easy to fish what you can't say. It is. You got the confidence and you get that you get that confidence and stuff. But this is Tackle Shop Live, and we are going to talk about it today. And uh just like always, we're gonna get in deep and personal with that offshore fishing technique. But we have to get some terminology <clears throat> straight. Yeah. On offshore fishing, too. Yeah, we do. Um coming up next weekend is the Conowingo Bass Fishing Open Series. Um, and we're the, the leading sponsor for that. And that's coming up this the next weekend, uh, June 18th. See what they did there? <clears throat> yeah. They put that on a Saturday. They did put it on a Saturday. I think that's part of the organization's attempt to keep to us keep out. the man down. Yeah, they're keeping us out of the out of the tournament. We can't we can't go because we have to work course brian didn't want to start and uh yeah they didn't want to they didn't want to yeah that's right they brian didn't want to have a have a butt whooping first thing but it's a great tournament series oh, it's um uh we talked about this last year me and george fished them last year we had an absolute ball we had a blast there is a ton of great guys that fish this tournament everybody is very very friendly there's a few left um, next week there, there was a lot of brand new fishermen that you know that never really tournament fish and that's what we're all about with this and um, so they're they're uh, they're doing it again this year. They're great one run tournaments. It's bigger and better than ever. Uh, so if you guys want to come down and fish, just be at the boat ramp at like 
quarter to five, I would say no later, four thirty to get yourself uh in the in the tournament. You can sign up right at the boat at the boat ramp. And uh it's a they, they don't mess around when it's blast off yeah, time either. It's a hundred dollar entry fee. You better be ready floating by five thirty because that's when they're blow they're 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 sending you. You see Brian walking down the dock with a bullhorn about the size of a uh apple watch in his hand yeah. you better watch out because he's about ready to cut you loose yeah absolutely oh and i got a very very special announcement tonight um and this one goes out to zoe acord oh my god zoe acord turns 19 today nick that's my youngest daughter she turns 19 and i see she chimed in here because she wanted me to this calls for a special occasion <laughs> right we're not everybody saying. join me we're not saying it we're not singing, singing happy birthday we're not to saying, Zoe. We're not singing happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Zoe. Happy birthday to you. 19 years old. Can't believe the time has went that far. Uh, man, hysterical. Thank you so much, uh, George, for bringing that up. Uh, and singing that song with me. That it's was very great. important. Yeah. Happy birthday, Zoe. Yeah, happy You're birthday, You're only 19 Zoe. once. That's right. Um, yep, that's the youngest one in the uh, <laughs> in the crew. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, on this Conowingo tournament here, uh, one of the things that me and George do is we give a uh, up to $1,000 bonus to the tournament for anybody who shops with SFT and spends $100 from Friday, the day before the, turn, the the 17th, starting on the 17th of June through the end of the season, and that would be the 1023 tournament. So you got all that time, which, which is not, not that hard to do. Spend 100 bucks with SFT, and uh, that's SFTTackle.com. We're in the shop here. Hold on to your receipts. Give them to the tournament director. Tell them you spent your hundred bucks. He'll mark you down as being paid. You're eligible, and you're eligible to win the extra bonus money at the end of the year. <clears throat> and last year we spread it out over the field, but this year I think we're going to go with the top team or the top two teams or where we might split it up to just Big to, money up in the house. Yeah, we're going to put it in the top two teams or whatever for the. I didn't think it was possible bigger. to come in here and spend less than a hundred dollars. It, it, it's very easy to do. That's, you know, a hundred bucks is very easy to do. So it's not like you guys aren't going to do it anyway, but Imagine that, if we had chicken wings, that just puts you in the tournament. Anybody that, uh, that wants to get in on that bonus money. And then you have to fish five of the tournaments to be eligible for the championship and then get that money. So, uh, five of uh, of seven, five of seven. So um, it's easy to do. It's fun. Um, so that's what you want to do. If you want to get involved with that, just make sure you buy buy that tackle. And the first tournament is next weekend, 6-18-2022. hundred dollar entry fee. It's a good time. Come on down. Give it a whirl. And the first Sunday one that they have, me and George are going to be there. We're going to fish all the Sunday ones. So um anyway uh the other announcement that i have is um for you guys who didn't get a chance to get in on the mega bass uh what do you call it thing um sleeper gill sleeper gill it was i i don't even know what to say it it, it we we posted it last night and they were gone and by the morning it was it was incredible crazy uh, event where they came in and went out like like in 12 hours literally um we do have another batch coming but it's not until august right george um hopefully it's more it's probably going to be closer to september yeah so sometime late august early september uh there's going to be another batch coming in and uh what we're going to do me and george we're going to hold off some off to the side and we're going to offer it to the listeners of the show to make sure you guys get some we didn't realize it was going to happen that quick and we were going to do it for tonight but i i, I don't even know what to say nick so i don't know what to say either because i wanted to talk about them too and yeah tackle shop live but there's nothing that so george and mike why did these things sell out that quick what do we need to know is there something crazy what? is this the new secret or what well the the 
the um, sleeper goby bait, which which is called a dark sleeper, dark sleeper, you know, has been a huge hit for the last three 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 or so years, and it catches fish. I mean, if they they flat out catch fish, and it's it's a quality piece of plastic, it's balanced properly, it does really well. And then this gill, they mess with this thing for a long time when they were, you know, they 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 were working on it for for three years to design this thing. And it all it was it's just a it's just a little. We showed it to we showed I think we showed it here on the show uh, a couple shows ago, and it, and it's just a little bitty thing, so it's perfect size. It's not like overly big. Anybody can use it, and it swims great, doesn't it, George? It swims real good. You can uh, you can feel the, the the tail kick real well on it. Um, I was using it as a flipping bait. You can, you can, you know, flip it into a, you know, a clump of grass and watch it nose down and swim down. It just looks like a bluegill swimming to the bottom. It's three quarters of an ounce. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, next year there'll be other size offerings, of course. Yeah. But it needs to be about three quarters of an ounce yeah. to get it to swim properly. Yeah. But, you know, and, it's and, uh, it's, and mega, we were, it's mega bass. It's the colors are unbelievable. You know, they cover the spectrum from you know the impact colors like the hot pink and the you know the big chartreuse to the natural colors. You know, like the different. Ah, there must be five or six variations of bluegill. Yeah, yep. to the you know the the the. Standard swim bait colors, you know, like uh, brownie M and MB Gizzard, MB brownie, Gizzard. Yep. you know, to to like a black and blue variation. So, I mean, the color range is complete. Uh, the profile is is right on. They worked a long time to get this thing right. And the other thing is people know from experience with Dark Sleeper, you know, you get a lot of baits out of this, you know, as far as catching fish. You know, you buy some, you buy some, uh, you buy some, some swim baits and man, it's, it's a one and done or a two and done, you know, this, this particular run of dark sleepers that they've done, you know, they're durable. Uh, it's almost like a badge of honor when you finally wear the damn thing out, you've caught so many fish on it, you know, uh, unless you live where toothies are and they bite the tail off, then you get a little pissed, but so it comes from that family line. And uh, we look forward to our next shipment. Um, yeah, so yeah, we'll make sure you guys know about them right away, so you guys get a shot at it. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Terry Klaus, how you doing? Joshua Sims, Paul Batters, what's up, man? Joseph, uh, uh, Bill McDermott, Joseph Castorino, yep. Uh, uh, Joshua Sims, here, Albert. Pavone, Tommy, Tommy Smaldon, Smaldon, St. Crest. How you doing, buddy? Thanks Smell for stopping down. in. Smaldon? Yeah. Smell Tommy Smaldon. Yeah, I know that. I, I just not very good with names. Uh, well, we, we've, we that's been proven. Ah, GDP's in proven. the house. What's up, GDP? Russell, My man. Russell Fuller, how you doing? Um, Yeah, so... Lisa Lake, what are you doing, buddy? Mark, how are you, pal? All right, so let's get going here. We're going to start talking this right off the bat. We're going to go offshore, and we're going to go offshore in a big way. Like I said uh, earlier, I think the biggest problem with offshore fishing is, you know, the the visualization of what you're fishing and it's making the graphs and the electronics are a very, very big part of this. And it's, and the graphs nowadays make it pretty easy with the mapping mapping that you get from the, um, oh. from these maps nowadays is, oh. is incredible. I, I can, you know, to, to, for throwback, I can remember, you know, um, you know, looking at a, a, a fold out map, you know, a re regular paper map, visualizing your head and getting out to your spot and, and then looking at the bank. And this is a big part of it. Looking at your, your surroundings, your bank, seeing how it comes into the water, seeing how the points are laid on the, on the, the dry land and how it would run into the water. Triangulating. And we would triangulate off of, off of uh, all kinds of stuff. 
and we would graph over it three or four times, uh, put the Troy motor in the water and graph around it, kind of flailing casts and then really dissecting it. And you then any waypoints down. No, we didn't have waypoints. Oh, that's right. They didn't have GPS. They didn't have GPS, man. We were, we were, this was all done by feel, you know, I'm and, just messing with you. Bro. And, uh, and you know, at one point I thought about putting a Loran system on, you know, with the big antennas. <laughs> Loran, Loran was very active. Yeah. And it was very accurate. Yeah. I mean, I mean, a lot of your offshore guys used it. Yeah. It was, that was based on time. Yeah. Um, where obviously GPS is based on, you know, yeah. transmissions, but, from but aliens, I, you know, for a lot of us older school guys, you know, it's a lot easier for us to go offshore now so much easier because we got the mapping and we have the, the, oh. gr the great side imaging and the down imaging and all this, imagine all the stuff you have. It's so simple to do it now because we, we had to do it old school style, you know, and learn it old school and really dissect it and think, think the whole spot out and then put your buoys in. We used a lot of buoys back then. You remember well, that? Well, yeah, we used to keep <clears> a buoy <throat> by the foot pedal of the trolling motor. Yeah with the weight unclipped and as soon as you'd get to, to right that, get you'd right kick the buoy off the side of the boat and the buoy and 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 actually buoy usage today is still important for offshore fishing yeah but, it is but the buoy the buoy we didn't mark where we were fishing we marked where we wanted the boat yeah so you would kick your buoy off here. You might kick multiple buoys too, because you know you had to kind of figure the breaks, you know the right the the, the tops of the point, you know the the, the 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 tips of the point, and you know it was it was. But it I'll tell you what it man, taught you a lot raise about. Raise your hand all, if you still have buoys in your boat, because I got oh yeah I got I got buoys in. The jet boat and in, in the skeeter because I mean I well, even use buoys in shallow water. We have buoys. We have buoys for for practicing, which are usually orange. Yes. And then we have buoys for tournament fishing, which are usually black. Stealth, stealth Ste buoys. And and then we even went as far as putting like little uh, camera. You know, you know, remember how you used to get the the um, the film and the, thir the thirty-five millimeter canisters, and we put the caulk. They don't up. use film anymore. They put silicone caulk up there, and we cap it with a little with a little rope on it and a little weight. And uh, when it was real, like touchy, you know, when it was real, like competitive. Option and we we put these things out. You option know, option two and three is no longer viable because <laughs> you there's no possible way you'll ever see a film canister yeah because <laughs> it's i mean me and you are done oh no our eyes are not our eyes and the, are and the painted black full-size buoy yeah that's a struggle that is a struggle it's but, often an argument too i think yeah. that's the bill you know that's the bill yeah <laughs> george you say there's no more film left i so i was in greg's boat i don't know if he's still on here gdp in his rod locker he has a polaroid camera yet I don't know why, but he's got it in there. He's ready to go. He's ready to go yep. just in case. Yeah, that's, that's that's for parties. You know, they like them at the parties and kids these days. You know, they're taking pictures in the photo booth and whatnot. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people that, you know, like are artists, arts, artists like people that use film, but no one else does. So film's yeah. over. Yeah. I bet you'd have a hard time finding film canisters now. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I you have to go to a professional film shop now to get that, but they still a lot of thirty five millimeter oh, you know stuff what? going on. Don't get you me know. any because I can't no, see those suckers. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of thirty five millimeter guys out there still, and and but you can't buy the film like in a Rite Aid like you used to. You have to go to like these well, film shops. You know, the point of the conversation is is that you know one of your one of your elements of structure fishing is a buoy. Well, yeah, and okay. and that element. We have, a un we have an uninvited that, guest at the door, kind of like a rodent. Yeah. And that element. We might have to go out and have to beat them off. Yeah. Just knock them down the street. Got any spray, George? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that element that George is talking about with the buoys is really understanding the structure that's underwater. Um, and I, even with the graphs and stuff today and the mapping, you can really see it. But it's also still to this day to narrow you know, when you're, especially when you go to a body of water, George, that you haven't been to and you're driving down the lake, you can visually 
see what kind of structure and how the points come into the water and that'll help you say oh you know what i want to check this out because you can kind of see how it lays and you can get up on your map and you can see your map and you can see how it comes in the water so it's still visual is very very important well mike and to all fairness to the conversation i mean let's just say you know 90 percent of the uh offshore structure that we fish you know mapping and a waypoint are more than adequate it's those complicated it, yeah it's those complicated tiny tiny spots well we, we were know, those real tiny spots where you know that that one cast is 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 required yeah that for me anyways that buoy you know there's the the, the problem with gps depending on the brand you have and depending on the version of your unit how old it is you know like older gps units and not that old ago mm -hmm. you know if your boat is not making some progress that gps will your your boat icon will start jumping on the screen yeah and yeah. you know your screen will flip yeah now if you have a more advanced unit or if you have if you went ahead and upgraded your puck to like a plus one or um you know the more deadly accurate puck that doesn't happen so you know like a lot of us still have you know, the old stuff that you know, you know yeah, a six seven year old uh, a six seven year old standard like low rants gps and that's, know, and that's where the buoy really comes when in. you stop moving you know that that forward momentum kind of puts that gps to sleep so to speak not really but you know your boat icon will jump around you know the things in front of you because your freaking lines in the water yeah but your boat's pointing the other way that and if it's a small target that's where that buoy comes in handy yeah you know and if you have to if you have to go back in your back hatch behind your driver's seat and take out 19 uh things to find a buoy you're not going to use it so you know as with getting your tackle ready, have that buoy ready. Yeah. That's going to be a key part of structure fishing. And like George said, you know, you throw that buoy, you kick that buoy over at a, at a particular spot and you, keep, and, and you keep your boat there. Right. And then you may make a bunch of casts to kind of feel the structure around. And then you hit that little sweet spot and you catch one and you throw it and catch another one. Now you have something to line up on. You have your boat in a certain position that you can, you see your marker right there, and you can line up on that uh, particular cast. Well, today, get a target, today, get a target. Yeah, today, get a target up on the shore. Yeah, line. on a shoreline, you get a target on the shoreline. A certain tree or a rock or a Tri peak of a building. Triangulation that really helps, and that kind of stuff. But today, what was interesting today was when we were watching MLF today. Um, Alton Jones was, and they were they were all fishing these off. A lot of these guys are fishing offshore points and stuff. But Alton Jones was breaking down this point, and it was really cool. And he said. He said, I usually catch them off the end over here, you know, where it drops in the water, but they're just not biting. He said, one of the other really sweet spots to a point is the turn where, where the point comes up, meets the flat, and it makes that turn, that contour makes that turn. He said, that's what I call the corner. And uh, so there's, there's a perfect instance where you kick a buoy over and you make a cast to the corner and you catch one and now you have reference to where that corner actually is even though it's on your map and you're looking at it you can be off by five ten feet either side but now at least you have a reference you got a triangulation on the bank which is also very important and you can make that cast over and over to kind of hit that sweet spot or what they call the spot on the spot yeah and and again you know we we, we mentioned visual visualizing these these contours visualizing these spots visualizing the cover on that piece of structure mm -hmm. uh if you look at your mapping if you have your screen up uh maybe you have multiple screens up but it or one screen that you like to split you know have your map up remember you need to zoom in tight so mm -hmm. when you're actually on that that structure and you're and you're fishing that that turn or you're a little more advanced and you went ahead and highlighted certain depth changes in certain colors where they pop for you and you want to, you know, be on that accurately, zoom in. 
zoom all the way in so that you are seeing those uh, nooks and crannies where you are. Okay, it's kind of like it's kind of like you know when you think you're on your waypoint and you're you know you're at you know point one nautical miles on your zoom range and you've been fishing for an hour and you can't feel that piece of wood down there and then you zoom into five hundred feet and you find out you're 200 yards away from your waypoint. Yeah. You know, zoom in on your mapping a little bit so that you can kind of clarify those contour lines. Um, you got great mapping for that reason. So, yeah. and then you're going to start being able to paint that picture in your mind. You know, it was interesting. Uh, Mike was talking about Alton Sr. Um, in the tournament that Brandon... Uh, Lester won the elite event last week. Um, and I forget who it was, but he fished briefly on like day two and it, and it may even have been, uh, Lester. He fished very briefly in practice. He didn't even fish this particular area where he ended up loading the boat, but he fished real briefly and then the next day of the tournament, which I think was day two, he's like, yeah, I, you know, day one, I rolled in here and I caught 21 pounds in like 15 or 20 minutes. Day two, I try, I kind of started to learn how this place laid. Yeah. You know, so the translation here and what you need to be gathering from this, you know, you can spend some time on a point or a ledge. Um, or a turn, or a or a shell bar, or a flat. You can spend some time there before you really understand the intricacies of it. Mm -hmm. You know the the two sweet spots, which are usually the hard spots on that mm -hmm. piece of cover, yeah, or or structure. Um, and I think that's what Brandon Lester was, you know, pointing out. You know, day two. He, he fished it a lot harder yeah. and he realized, oh, well, wait a minute, you know, these fish are going to move over here. Yeah. And, you know, uh, that helped him further in the tournament. Well, on your home lake or if you're away out of town, maybe you're fishing a club tournament. Maybe you're going to fish a tournament somewhere. Maybe you're going on vacation with the boys and, you know, you're offshore because it's post-spawn. Uh, spend some time. Yeah. You know. Uh, learn it, get it in your head, have a picture, have an image, you know, uh, dragging the bottom helps. Yeah. It, 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 that's a big, that's a big point right there that George said, you know, when you actually get up now, you're starting to fish and you start dragging the bottom, you'll notice the difference between the gravel size, you know, maybe this on the top of the point, there's, there's, there's smaller gravel out towards the end of the point. There's some chunk rock off to the sides or maybe some stumps that are on there and you're running into those, you might be bumping into some brush piles, but you, you know, when you're dragging along it, it, it tells you a ton. It really, that's how you figure out and dial into that spot and say, man, when I throw over here, this is really chunky over here. And this is where I'm getting my bites and that's the sweet spot. And then over here, I have this one stump that I caught one off. I, I need to, that might re keep reloading. You got to keep throwing over there every now and again, you know? So, you know, that's the part of the fishing part then that can give you information for dialing in on that particular offshore spot. Well, you also. know, a lot of times you'll roll up on a, on a, <clears throat> you know, a, 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 maybe a piece of cover on a point. Okay. So a brush pile on a point, pretty traditional, you know, offshore structure and, you know, it'll be active and, you know, the first or second cast with a crankbait, you'll catch a fish. But after that, it kind of ends, and the crankbait doesn't really tell you much about, you know, the hard spots. I mean, it tells you a little bit, unless you're really good at cranking. You know, that's where, you know, you pull in, you make a couple quick casts with a crankbait for the active fish. You know, if there's a – usually when you go – uh, post spawn and you go from spot to spot to spot, you know, you're, you're fishing like groups or small schools or medium sized schools of fish. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, that that first couple casts, those active fish pounce. So the crankbait is a great choice for that. Yeah. Um, but then <clears throat> you need to go and slow down, which is which is going to be a big part of tonight's show because some of what we used to do we're changing our ways. And, but what's nice about that is, you know, be it a Carolina rig, be it a football jig, or be it a Magnum shaky head, which is what we really want to chop up tonight. Mm -hmm. That gives you that feel. Yeah. That lets you know that there's a rock over here. Yeah. Or that lets you know that there's a, a, a patch of shells here. Yeah. And those fish will almost always gravitate toward the hard spots on the structure yeah almost always yeah so you know the, the those baits are are the baits that will will dial you in on that you know old school stuff carolina rigging you know we did a great show on carolina rigging so you can go back through this is a great opportunity for that um but then as you learn your lake and as you learn these spots and you start because what, what's nice about this george and, and 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 the reason you would do this nick and go through all this 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 stuff um is because these are the spots that reload all the time once the post spawn starts there will be fish there whether you catch them or not you know whether they're active or not is 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 the question but those fish will be there all the way until the fall transition and they start pulling out of there so once you find them in june now you're fishing you know june mid-june late june you know they kind of get on that stuff better and better and better and then july and august you these are spots that you want to have to go to and check them because if that school's there fired up it's 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 instantaneous these are the spots where schools of fish go to they're not single isolated fish these are schooly spots and then you can start cataloging your lake with these with these brush piles with these little hard spots with these sweet spots and you can catalog your lake throughout and you'll see that over the years, these spots, some of these spots continue to produce year after year after year. And all you have to do is your homework one time and you have it in your in your in your graph. Um, so that's how important this this type of fishing is. It is, you know, we we always say it all the time. There's always a shallow bite, okay, on a lake. And there's always a there's always this deep bite, and there's always, you know, there's there's all these different bites. But this is if once you learn this, honestly. And you really figure it's the easiest bite because it's low, low pressure. You know, it's a, it's a much lower pressure uh, uh, type of situation because there's a lot of them. And, uh, uh, every, you know, a lot of these guys don't want to take the time to learn them. And you can pull up on these spots and just hit these little sweet spots and, and load the boat up. Real, real quick. Question for you guys. So you have listeners and, and viewers out there that don't really have a confidence in offshore. And George brought up a really good point in the beginning of the show, talking about the verbiage and and what we're talking about here. Can you kind of break that down first before, you know, we yeah. get into it too deep? Yeah. So offshore stuff is just exactly what that means. It's everything offshore. Um, most of the guys on here, I'm sure, watch the tournaments on TV, and you know, you hear guys talk about ledges. Um, but what it is is really is in a nutshell is is the the structure that's on the lake that holds fish in that deeper cooler water in the summertime is really what you're looking for and that has to do with a whole lot whole and the, and the verbiage is points right george yeah well i think the biggest problem is is that people call cover structure Right. Structure is a point. Yeah. Structure is a flat. Yeah. Structure is a river ledge. Um, any, a any, hump. any, a hump, a hump is a, is, is a good example. Yeah. A ledge, and then, you know, cover is what's on that piece of structure. Right. A, so a, 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 a piece of, uh, like a log, you know, brush pile, a brush pile, pile, rock pile, rocks you know shell bed what have you yeah. and, I, and i and i think a lot of people who are watching tournaments and and reading articles and and they're they're kind of confused about that and and i think you need to go back to that real basic level and get that terminology right so that you know when you're trying to learn this stuff you actually know what what 
what that means because I hear it all the time where people are calling a brush pile structure. You know, and if that's what you really believe, then you're missing the point of whatever, you know, you're listening to or reading or watching. Yeah. You know, um, so that that's that's kind of important. You know, we hear tons and tons and tons and tons and tons about ledges, you know, and really I don't I don't think people understand just how basic a ledge is. A ledge is any kind of a semi-consistent drop-off. You know, so let's say you have a big flat coming off of the bank, a big, giant, underwater flat. You know, you look up at the hillside, and you just see this kind of flatter Gradual, angle, angle. gradual angle. That's going to continue into your lake, and you're going to idle out on the on that so far, and all of a sudden it's going to drop off. It might be... One foot. The flat might go out to 15 foot and drop off to 18 foot. Yeah. And that might be pretty consistent. And, you know, you can zigzag back and forth with and idle that, and it'll be a pretty consistent drop. That's a ledge. That's mm. a ledge. I fished a tournament years ago on Lake Erie at a buffalo way out in the middle of the dead gum lake and it went from 32 to 35 feet just as just like somebody went down there with a little bulldozer and bulldozed it out that's a ledge or a more traditional ledge is the drop off into the creek channel yeah or the drop off into the river channel Okay, a ledge can be very shallow on top. A, a river ledge can be three, four feet deep on top. Yeah. You know, if it's a navigable body of water, there'll be a buoy there. Yeah. Okay, there'll be a buoy there. So, you know, map study will point out, you know, ledges, which are very easy to figure out. The problem is, depending on the body of water you on, those dadgum ledges can go on for miles. Yeah. So, you know, let's specifically stick with this ledge because you need to break it down. You can't realistically, as, you know, as most of us are, are hardcore weekend warriors, because we're all hardcore. Everybody on this show is hardcore. Oh, yeah. You know, but we work for a living, so we don't have endless time to go out like our elite tournament buddies and our Bass Pro Tour tournaments that we watch you know these guys talk about idling a lake from 5 30 in the morning till 9 30 at night uh we're pretty much not going to do that mm. okay so map study and that could be sitting in your garage with a chili pop scrolling through your map on your new hummingbird 10 that you got with your little lake master chip in there or what have you and zooming in and zooming out and dropping waypoints and shortening up your your date on the lake the next day or, or that weekend, you know? Yeah. And so these ledges, let's let's break them down. Let's let's break them down to high percentage points. So let's I like to think of them as intersections where a creek channel comes out to a river channel and forms an intersection, right? And the fish follow things like that. They don't specifically stop at the red light and turn left, but you know, they kind of follow that depth change, you know. Suspended fish will always suspend over a depth change. It'll always be shallow to deep. They'll be suspended above that. Well, there's, there, you know, there's turns of that. There's turns. There's little crooks, and you know, it could be just a little crook in that, in that um, another that, key that ledge, another is, key spot, which is a key spot. Those fish can get in that little crook and and wait for the current. You know, if you have a, a lake where a you, you know reservoir where they're drawing water, they'll get in those little crooks and wait for the bait to get pulled over or. Or well, that's exactly, along, that's, along that's the a great side. Point. Yeah, yeah, along the side you of know, those. If that ledge is a mile long and there's one bend in it, yeah, you can bet you want to check that oh, out. Oh, absolutely. Now but the problem is finding it. No, it's easy to find. <laughs> it's easy to find. That's dude. not. It's not easy to find for a lot of guys. Well, if you got one of these, it's easy to find. The yeah. problem is, yeah, everybody else that has one of these, yeah, it's find easy it. for them to find. Yeah, but there's because also look at that map picture right there. there. Yeah, there's there's also. <laughs> There's also like, you know, rock piles on them or rock that's been eroded away to where there's more rock in that area than others. There's uh, snags that get on them. 
log snags, you know, and you're looking for all that stuff. And it takes time to find that. But when you find it nowadays, you can just whoop, hit your waypoint. And that thing's going to pay off for you one of these days. Um, George and I were in, reintroduced ourselves to a, a, a reservoir that we haven't fished in years last year. And uh, we went out uh, scanning, structure scanning. We did. And this is a this is a body of water. It doesn't have I a map. It felt like a big GDP that day. Yeah, it doesn't have a map. You know, it, there's there's no mapping to this body of water. So we were just out there graphing around. And, and I you know, we remembered some stuff and. And uh, we remembered seeing some some of this and some of that. And we went out and found one of these one of these ledges, and we graphed the we we started to graph this ledge. It took us a while, and then we found the grass and we marked it and we made a few waypoints on there. And then uh, there was nothing there. It was a it was the, it was the wrong yeah. We caught a couple of caddies, but it was the wrong time of year. But we said to ourselves, we did this homework. We made a couple of waypoint marks on it, and it's out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's literally out in the middle of nowhere, and it's a big area. And we said to ourselves, this is going to pay off one of these days. So, you know, that's that's what you do. And when you're looking for structure, you spend the time and you go out there and you and you and you graph around and you you visualize and you start putting this together and you start making these marks. And it may not pan out for you now, but someday it will. And and for us, it was two months later or a month and a half later, we 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 were like fishing and we weren't all of our other shallow stuff went away. And we were like, Hey, it's time to go out here and look for this. So we went out and looked for this, got on the spot, started fishing around, started to narrow it down more and more and more, narrow it down more and more and more. And boom, we catch a limit, you know, and it just, it puts you back in the game. And it was work that we did, you know, months ago. And now it paid off for us at that one time. So that's what we're talking about when we're offshore well, shore fishing, you know, and, I don't care if you have a, you know, uh, 10 year old unit on your boat or a brand new Helix 10 that you just bought from SFT. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You know, on my boat, I have, I have brand new graphs up front. I've got, I've got a graph I run that's from 2007 because it's extremely accurate. I have yeah. a 2007 graph in the flush mounted, and I have about a 2010 or, or, or nine, and they're both extremely accurate. And, and my point is, I, it, you don't need, don't feel like you can't play the off. I guess my point is, don't feel like you can't play the offshore game because you don't have the. Dude, no, we did this. At, at the beginning of the show, we talked about this. We used to do this without any of this mapping. You don't need you, you just need a depth finder and a, and a and a half assed one at that. You know, you really don't need anything. Well, pretty much everything has uh some sort of either down or side imaging now. Yeah, and, that, that's all you, you know, need. I would recommend and you need you to know, be able to look at the shoreline and you need to be able to say, This is the way this that this structure comes into the water, and this is this is the way I want this. So this kind of narrows it down for you. And you just start zigzagging over top of it and and you start putting it putting yeah. together and and, uh, and, 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 and you're, and you're doing this, you know, the you're point doing is, The point is when you, when you find that first piece and you catch some fish off of it as a new offshore fisherman, your confidence level skyrocket, skyrocket, mm. and you will no longer feel like a lost, lost. like a, like a, like a lost birdie, you know, like, right? a, like a lost set lock off fishing docks. Huh? Like a lost set lock fishing dog. You know what's cool, guys, too? Like, I know. You're just little, torturing him over there tonight. A little you? birdie <laughs> told me that. Yeah, he pissed me off. He put it on Saturday. And <laughs> pissed me off. Somebody on this camera right now might have a stack of paper from an old paper graph yet. Oh, yeah. But uh, in today's world that we, we're in, you know, these graphs can do so many things. And you really got to learn how to use them. Because I remember last year, I'm up at uh, Lake Champlain. And I find fish in about 13 foot of water. Now, I don't know the whole lake. I'm learning the lake. Yeah. I literally used my shading that yeah. I could use on my graph, your helix and solixes and all them, 
And I could find other spots on the lake that were producing the exact same way. Right. And you have the capability now. You didn't have that years ago. You have yeah, that. Yeah, it, you got to right. learn how to use it. And, and, it, and, and what that do for you? Narrowed down the whole oh, entire lake it, to it so many spots. You know, so easy for you to just to run that stuff. It was crazy because literally when I marked that 13-foot range, whatever color it was, I could go to any spot that had the right cover. Did you sit on that 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 GDP seminar and learn that? I'll because tell you what that that when he did that and showed us that how he did that on that one lake and did well yeah. on that one and he said, "Look, it just narrows down everything for you." It works. I, it freaking blew me away. Yeah, and I have a little. Uh, it is good. A little tip that I can give people: if you go on a new lake, like to me, it was the St. Lawrence. To me, it was Lake Champlain. Yeah, there's a lot of places where you can hit your boat. Yeah, and what I would do is I would shade five foot and lower yeah that way those areas there i knew yeah i'm running down the lake like yeah. be wary yeah and then the other thing i would do is once i found fish try to develop a pattern otherwise yeah you know use your graphs to their capability if yeah. you're going to invest in them yeah right well yeah. and 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 if you have existing graphs and you have you know like i like i was saying earlier and you have these uh, you know, they're, my graphs are old and well, you know what? Nothing changed except for some of the functionality, the accuracy sonar is sonar side imaging is side imaging. I mean, the, what makes that work has not changed. It's the right. same deal. Right. So trust your graphs, learn your graphs, you know, and if you're really uncomfortable offshore, Find something that's real simple to scan and confirm by fishing mm -hmm. and build that confidence level yeah. up, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, that's really what this show's about is, yeah. is, is how to get offshore. Why do we go offshore? Yeah. And maybe a and few then, techniques that we've started to employ. Yeah. And then, th and then build confidence in that and say, you know, I can do this even with everything that I have or the stuff that I have, you can do it. You really can. Uh, Damn River boys are in the house. How you doing? George Ashbridge is here. How you doing, George? Chris Deal. Yeah, you're a little late. Seven, you're 41 minutes late, Chris. You missed everything. You have to listen to it on the podcast. Nah, we're just getting started, Chris. Which uh, we have our podcast. We, we upload. We try to upload every other week, although I got behind about three weeks. As you guys all saw, they downloaded uh, this all, all this week. But I try to put them up every week after the show. You can go back over. Dave Wilder's in the house. Dave Wilder's here. How you doing, Dave? He's an A1 from day one. He is an A1 from day one. He and catches them. He, he catches them. He's been known to catch one or two. Yeah. Richie Martinelli, how you doing, buddy? Uh, yeah, and this is cool from Chris Deal. All this stuff we're talking about when you're going out and you're and you're looking about the, the structure and you're looking for this stuff. He says it's like pre-scouting for, for deer. Absolutely. We, all the hunters out there, they go scouting. It's the same thing. You're scouting areas out. You're learning the patterns of the fish and you're learning the areas and how they're walking and what they're doing. Absolutely. That that's a big that's a big deal right there. Um what uh, oh and um uh, uh Mike Barr. Hey, brother, how you doing? They're down fishing at Pocomoke. I don't fish to Pocomoke too much, but those guys love it down there. They've been smashing them down there. I hope you guys are having a great time. I rod Devin Norwood Kinston. That's been a while since I saw you, buddy. Um, checking the Potomac for practice. Uh, BFL this weekend. Yeah, right? big BFL. I hope you do well down there, buddy. Brian Ward, how are you? Andy Garrett. Um, yeah, man. Amy Lynn Brown, how are you? Good, good, good. I'm glad everybody's stopping in. Really good to see you guys. And thanks so much for stopping in. Now, part of this whole deal is, hey, Mike, I wanted to have a part of this. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I Mike. just wanted to have a little fun with you and George real quick. Yeah. So you guys have done this a long time and you guys are going to talk about some great baits that are out there, but you guys had to, to search without all this stuff. What was your favorite bait? that you could find out if it was a hard bottom, what was your search bait to pick apart? What kind of cover or what kind of, you know? Well, I, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, back in when we were doing it, it was two, really two baits for me and George, but, but for me, really, it was the Carolina rig. The Carolina oh, rig yeah. just was easy as hell. From, 
And the Carolina, we would it, use it. Yeah, it was just easy. It was really easy. We used it from shallow to deep. We did. We used it from literally from six foot of water or on less. flats, you know, and five foot of water down to Potomac fishing in the springtime, just looking for those shell bottoms. Um, we used it uh, for, and that's, and you can see how I said that. We used it for finding shell bottoms on, on the Potomac River because we, you know, our grass didn't really show you that stuff, you know, and you didn't really understand it. You know, you were dragging around and, and you would look find these shell beds on these cool looking cove banks, you know, you know, it was the, and we knew that we wanted to go to the dark mud banks, you know, that's the ones you wanted to kind of go to. And then you would drag out around here looking for this, uh, these hard shell bottoms and, and then you would start catching fish. And, and, um, so Carolina rig was so, so instrumental in us learning. And then the other one, of course, is, is for fishing was, was deep cranking. We we're, we we're big, huge deep crankers. Plus we, dragging a jig. Well, he did drag a jig. So, I, I didn't drag a jig. You too know, much. basically, it, it's kind of like here. Here's the way we look at it. So we, we we touched on this earlier. So you have, you have you have found fish. Okay, we're gonna make some assumptions here. We did some scanning. We did some map study. We did our homework. We found uh, two three spots with fish. Let's say we're having a great day. We found three areas holding fish that's a great day two's two's awesome one's good so you know the kind of the routine is roll in put the trolling motor in the water you know get you're gonna have a waypoint you're gonna have your map up you're gonna have your you know your graph on many of us are gonna have forward looking now um uh, and you're going to move up to your area where you need your boat located. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your your brush pile or your rock pile or your hard spots out there, crankbait. Yeah. Crank, 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 pretty aggressively. You know, time frame that we're talking is now. You know, uh, from, from this latitude south, it's post-spawn. For the most part, don't kill me on this next full moon here. I, I grant it, there's a couple fish going to spawn yet, but a lot of fish are wandering out mm -hmm. on our reservoirs. A lot of fish are, you know, and south of us are out and ganged up as witnessed by last week's elite tournament. Yeah. yeah. You know, on uh, Pickwick. Yep. So, you know, we're going to, the, 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 the crankbait is a player. We're not going to really get too deep into the crankbait tonight because we want to focus on more of the touchy feely stuff, but you know, enough crank, enough depth to hit your, to hit your cover. And you know, that, that, and this sounds real easy, but if you're casting a crankbait at a brush pile that you can't see on a point. And I realize these pros make it look like it's a piece of cake. It's not. Um, you will need to make multiple casts. You may even get frustrated. But you found it. It's out there. Stay at it. I like to pick a crankbait that runs a couple feet deeper than the water I'm in. So, you know, if that brush pile is in 15 feet of water and it sticks a couple feet up off the bottom, I'm going to pick a crankbait that runs, you know, 15 to 18 feet deep that I can bail out past that thing. And I want to scream it past there and bang it into it. And, you know, speed kills. And, you know, the, the concept that Mike and I <clears throat> work on all the time is the level of aggression of our baits. Crankbait, most aggressive, pick off the active fish and, and i'm talking a good day here some days they're not active yeah, sometimes it's a top water first thing too you know top water and then crankbait and then you know could be whatever could be whatever yeah you're right you know we maybe maybe we get maybe we catch we're happy if we get one that's it right and then maybe those fish don't respond to that crankbait anymore that's why there's big piles of rods on the deck you know mm -hmm. next we're going to the to the slow and low yep you know and we've talked about the carolina rig yep Yep. on this show to death and everybody and loves it and, and the carolina player rig will come out it's a player yep. you know if we're fishing a team tournament one of us is going to carolina rig yeah but we've added a few other twists into our game by watching and learning from the pros yeah exactly and a lot of this stuff guess, guess what george we're still learning every day 
all the time. We're, we're learning every single day. All the time. Yep, so important. All the time. And a lot of this stuff is because of, you know, fishing pressure. You know, big bodies of water aren't even big anymore. I mean, there's a lot of people fishing. Yeah. They're finding this, these fish. Yep. They're putting pressure on them. These fish are getting, yep. you know, they're getting educated. Yeah. You know, so the finesse tactics are undeniable. Mm -hmm. You know, and we want to talk about the big worm. One of the one of the things that led to this topic tonight was we wanted to talk a little bit about drop shotting offshore, and we wanted to talk about the big worm. Now, by drop shotting offshore, we're not referring to like finesse open water, you know, smallmouth. We're talking about drop shot. power drop shot power shot in cover. Get yep. And yep, this is this is this is the hardcore big, stuff. By big worm, you know, we're talking about something that we've adopted. Um, that is I don't even call it a trend. It's just it's just a better way of doing business. And it's Magnum finesse worms. So I'm gonna get a couple of them out here, show you what I mean. But Magnum finesse worms are big, profile, oversized. Like this is a this this uh, blueberry color here is a mag trick, and this watermelon red is a Z-Man mag fatty. Okay, these are big diameter worms. They're more they're more bulky and buoyant and 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 in the fish's face, but. Where years ago, we would Texas rig everything. You know, the trend as of late, and late being several years now, is a big shaky head. So, by big shaky head, I mean, you know, 5-0 hook, half ounce, three-quarter ounce. Uh, pick your brand, whatever you like. This is a uh, Strike King, Tour Grade, uh, Magnum Head. You know, we got the Big Bite Bait, the traditional ball head, half and three quarter, Gamagatsu, you know, Big Hook. You know, you got the Picasso, football style shaky head, half and three quarter, Big Hook. But that... That whole shaky head concept with that oversized finesse worm kind of positions that worm in an upward posture a little bit. <clears throat> and, you know, you've got that big head kind of yeah. kind of digging in. But one of the things that you're going to need to really touch on there is, there is, you know, make sure you go heavy enough. If, if you don't feel like you're feeling the bottom properly, you know, just go heavier. You know, they, they make these things, what, up to three quarters? Yeah. I mean, half and three quarter is kind of like yeah standard issue. Three just, eighths as light as you're going to get. Yeah. Make sure that you're, if you're not feeling the bottom right, just go up and wait. Now, you know, the three quarters yeah, have five or six foot of water, but, you know, in 10 or 15 foot of water, I mean, three, three eighths is like ultra light. It is. You're going, you're going half ounce. I mean, this isn't, don't worry about the weight. This thing's going to do what it's supposed to do. It's, it's but, actually, but it really, you know, guys are always bling, 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 yeah, banging but, through there. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, uh, really get confused with dragging the bottom in deep water. They, they just, they, and because they always try to go too light and, and I see it in here all the time. Guys are like, I just don't feel what's going on. What's cause you're too light. Just keep piling weight on, you know, it doesn't hurt you in deep water on it on these type of techniques because it, it, it it's a big worm. It's sticking up off there. That little that head that's three quarter ounce. That's part of the whole rig. It's not hurting that that presentation, and it is telling you a ton of information. It's telling you about the hardness of the bottom, and you need that weight. So don't be afraid to pile it on, man. Just keep piling it on. So now, guys, now you're you're using this big worm on a heavier weight. We definitely can't use light like the uh, tackle for this uh, rod and reels no and that. no absolutely not you know and but you don't need heavy weights no either what what you don't need a big heavy rod for it no 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 but you need a you need a and we throw all this stuff on bait casting yeah so we're throwing it on seven two seven threes seven you know seven ones medium heavy medium heavy and, medium heavy to heavy 
Yeah. Quad, fast action, uh, extra fast 50, action. 15 pound, uh, 15 pound fluorocarbon. Yeah, we'll get exactly, her done. Exactly. Um, you know, if you're a braid guy, you know, you can go to, you know, 20 to 30 pound braid with a leader. Um, that'll get her done. Or I just, don't like braid for this technique. Eh, some guys do. Just saying. Some guys do. You know, some guys are braid guys and they'll, they'll go braid to leader, but you know, you need 20 pound because you're down in the, you're, you're at least 20, but I like 30. Uh, I always Carolina rigged with the 30 pound braid to a uh, 15 pound leader because I like the feel and the hook set. You know, the, the, you know, don't forget you're in deep water and that's a big ass hook. So that braid, if you're, you know, that braid will help you with your hook set. Big Magnum Sankos uh, are another great option on these big shaky heads. This is a big giant TRD from Z Man. Yamamoto makes the six and the seven inch Sanko. They're great uh, on, on a shaky head, also. But the big, the big deal that's kind of become the deal of the deal is the mag trick, the mag, you know, fatty, the the different brands, yep. different names um, on that shaky head. Great tool for getting bit. Yep. Be it wood, be it grass, be it you know deep, be it mid depth. Yep. Great, great tool. Um, and it's something that we all do on a lighter weight basis. Yeah. So we all shaky head fish. Yeah. We're just mag we're just magging, magging it up. up. Magging yep. it up. So the other thing that, that I don't see you have there, but it's the same kind of concept as the uh wobble head. That's a great bait for this kind of fishing. Yeah, I mean you could definitely factor that in there, you know. I I, I mean that's hey, dude. You got to say it because I mean, I like to simplify this stuff down a little bit here. And, you know, I don't want to have like every option known to man. No, but what, you're not, you're, you're at drop shot. You're at shaky power, shaky head. You're at wobble head and Carolina. Here's four, four different ways to do yeah, it. And we do all those. Yeah, we do all those. I wasn't going to go wobble head. No, I'm just saying for, for guys that are watching, you know, a wobble head is basically the same setup with just, just the hooks detached from the weight. But I like and, to go heavier on that for some reason. Go if I'm fishing a half ounce, big shaky, then I then I'm gonna start with a three quarter wobble. Yeah, it just that thing works better heavier. I mean, you know, those guys catch a ton of fish on that thing out there, man. And it's different than a Carolina rig, and it's a lot like fishing the, the power shaky head on the big power power shaky uh heads it's a lot like that you, you drag you just drag it along it's it's pretty simple but and of course but, you know mike we're talking about the magnum finesse worms and the magnum trick yeah. worms right now yeah um i mean it goes without saying absolutely that we're throwing 10 inch worms also i mean yeah. we're just not going down that path tonight because yeah man, we don't have enough time we don't right? and, and and uh so these are great techniques um and, when, and like george said when you're drop shotting don't be afraid, man. Three eighths ounce. Put it on there. Drop it down there. Drag it along. You know, make it happen. Make feel the bottom so that you can tell what is going on with your casts. And uh, and that information just comes in and it comes in and it comes in. You're feeling the mud. You're feeling the rock. You're feeling the difference uh, in, in all these things. And it's just giving you that information and you're dissecting that spot and you're coming up with that awesome that awesome deal there. Dave Chalamater, how you doing, buddy? Uh, Ryan Saltzman did win today at a Bass Pro Tour. And, and yeah, he's a great guy. We, we we know him. We know him. And he congratulations to him. Um, Jeff Riddle, uh, you, use, you use these on our river? Um, absolutely. I mean, me and George on, the, on these reservoir parts of, of the river, like uh, – you know, the lower Susquehanna River from Long Level to the to the to the Maryland uh, uh, down to uh, Conowinga Dam, Maryland line down there. We fish all this stuff. This is deep water structure fishing. It's the same thing there as it is anywhere. Um, this is this is where we kind of cut our teeth. We cut our teeth on deep water structure fishing on the Conowinga pool, which is the Susquehanna River. So um, and then we just from there, we, we, we just expanded and expanded as we as we. As took we, it on the road. As we started to go on the road, we took it on the road, and we just we just kept going and going and going. All of our little lakes around here, they're all it's all great for that. I mean, it's any little lake you guys have around your house, um, reservoir around your house. Not eighty percent of the people that go on that reservoir fish the bank, so you're only competing against twenty other people out on these structures. 
And let me tell you something. These structure fish on a lot of these lakes that people don't offshore fish too much, you can find a little sweet spot and absolutely crush them every time you go there. And this is what we're talking about. We and George did this all over our lakes around here. And um, yeah, wow. sometimes you catch them, sometimes you don't. Or some, or somebody would find out about it, and then, and then you were it, the big thing was is who can get there quicker. You know. Well, watch your percentages there because there's a lot of bodies of water. You know, you get down on that Tennessee River. Yeah. It's eighty offshore, twenty onshore, from post spawn until fall. Oh no! I, I exactly, but I'm I'm talking. You know this uh, uh, the fellow here. He he was uh, he was saying about um, uh, whether whether we do it around here, and I'm like absolutely. And oh yeah, around here in the northeast, literally in the northeast. Now it's changing, but in the northeast, there's more people fishing the bank or visible structure cover. Uh, uh, yeah, visible cover, grass, trees rock piles that they see can visually see or buoys that they can visually see and go to and fish around the buoys. Um, then there is guys going out and finding the hard to find stuff. There's a lot more guys doing that other stuff than, than the offshore offshore stru structure guys. I thought it was interesting watching these tournaments, how these guys rotate through their, their, uh, different setups and, uh, which is what we're doing right now. Yeah, we're rotating really cool. through our different setups. Yep. Yes. crankbait carolina rig uh magnum trick mag fatty well you, it, know, you know what's next huh you know what you make your money on next drop shot damn skippy. yeah so you know it's funny because you hear these guys talking about firing up the school all you're doing is you know when you're out there structure for the school was there they're waiting for bait fish to come by or whatever to, to fire them up but if you can fire them up uh, artificially by catching one it, it can it can fire the school up and you can catch pop two or three or four um this is these are kind of spots where you can see people st sitting on all day this is what this kind of fishing is if it's a big school i'm saying but this is what you know when you see guys sitting on a spot all day long and they're kind of always cashing these checks they they're on they're on a spot that just has fish there all the time and they just keep reloading. And I bet you a lot of people on here are glad you just brought that up. Yeah. Because if you're sitting on a spot, what is your opinion on that school's down there, you catch one, two, three, four fish. Some of these tournaments you put them in your box and you're taking them the way in. Yeah. Some of these tournaments you're throwing them right back. Yeah. We've always heard you don't want to throw that fish right back. Or yeah. Whatever. What's your opinion on that? I don't believe any. I don't either. <laughs> okay. They got a little pee, pee, pee head little brain in them, man. They don't care. That's my it. opinion. They don't, they don't care. They'll go back and say, I don't know what the hell that was. I don't know. Whoa. You know what do they do? Don't, don't, don't bite the worm. You know? Yeah. That hurts. You know, <laughs> don't fight the worm. But I, I know guys who really believe in that and they will, even when they're fun fishing, they'll box them. They'll box them for a while and then they'll start pitching them back after they calm down a little bit i guess i don't know yeah and i've seen guys throw that out the other side of the yeah i throw it out the other side <laughs> it's like <laughs> what the hell uh you know what they're they're fish they, they're they're not that freaking they're not that smart right they, they're just they're you know when you're triggering schools it's just getting something in front of them that 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 is that is uh trigger it's not a it's not a, th a thought process, anything whatsoever. These fish are looking for something that triggers them, their, th the feeding stimuli in them, and then they just start to feed, you know? And a lot of times it's bait fish moving through, you know, the school's there. If the school's there, they're there for a reason. That's because bait fish comes by all the time. You know, there's school bait fish will come by and then they can feed whenever they want. So. You know, we were so, we we were talking about braid briefly about Carolina rigging with braid, and you said you like thirty pound braid for Carolina rigging, yeah. and I said I don't care for braid for that this offshore style of fishing. Yeah, which I don't, I, you know, <clears throat> I should I should have clarified that. Yeah, because when it comes to the spinning rod techniques of drop shotting and Nico rigging, um, all braid to a leader. Um, and I like, uh, I, I like to, I like to call it a power spin setup. Mm -hmm. You know, I like a, I like a longer rod 
with more of a medium heavy, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, power because we're fishing a little bit of a bigger worm. We're fishing it in a Texas rig style on this drop shot. And, you know, we need a little more power to set the hook with a spinning rod now and move the fish a little away from the cover. Um, and, you know, the spinning rod gets a bad rap. You know, I, you know I, I used to do this all the time. I used to fish tournaments for, I mean, it was not uncommon for me to fish four or five tournaments in a row and not even have a spinning rod in my boat. You know, and that was that was a closed minded attitude that I had. Um because I didn't know any better. But the spinning rod gets a bad rap as just a finesse little fish rod. I I I I'll tell you what, my last 10 or 15 years of exposure to this, these techniques have proven that as BS. You know, the drop shot is a big fish technique. The Nico rig is a big fish technique. This is not just, it's not just, it's like the old rap that the shaky head got. Well, it's just, you know, it's just a limit. No, I disagree with all that. It's another tool tool that gives me another level of, you know, from, you know, from crankbait to Nico rig, you know, break it down, assign, a, assign those things levels. This is another one of those levels where I can get in there I can rattle around in the kitchen with my weight and I can shake that worm up there, you know, up off the bottom. Everything else has been on the bottom. Now I'm up off the bottom. But I mean, what if I catch a five pound fish in a brush pile? Do I want a freaking medium powered spinning rod with eight pound test line? No, I want braid to a 12 pound leader. And I want a rod that I can turn that fish his head and get them once I get them in open water. I mean, you know, we can we can swim. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that's kind of how this has evolved. <clears throat> you know. Well, you know, the ne the Nico rig is is I guess my nemesis. I'm trying to figure that one out. I, I just started kind of getting it into that. Um, but what's given me confidence is watching these guys on these shows. You know how they're how they're doing it and 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 they're catching them and they're doing so well with it that it's almost something you got to do. You know what they say, Nick? It's almost like it's magic. I mean, like, I mean, like, it's literally almost like it's magic. You know what I'm saying, Nick? What are you saying? Did you blur that out? What are you saying, George? I like it. Did you blur that out? Well, you couldn't quite see it. Well, you didn't it's called see the it? magic worm. Oh. Everybody's talking about it already. It's almost like it's magic, Nick. Robo worm, magic worm, by Miss by missile baits. Missile baits. So, but that was just some fun, just to have some fun on a hot new worm release, which we'll talk about later. That was just for <laughs> that was a ha ha. But this style of worm, I like it, George. Did you like it? Yeah, I liked it. Ma it's magic. I would have said magic man. This style of worm is what I'm a magic man is man. what makes this whole <laughs> offshore shaky head i mean uh drop shot game work you know the six inch you know the zoom trick worm the six inch robo worm the magic worm mm -hmm. you know the the missile quiver worm you know these kind of worms um are very well suited to a number of techniques one of them being this drop shot and, you know, everywhere you look in this country, something in this morning dawn slash Aaron's morning dawn color is rocking. Um, but you got to you got to Texas rig it. So we're using a straight shanked hook. Yeah, that's that's the big thing. You know, we're not nose hooking these baits. So for all you drop shotters out there that are new to offshore um fishing we are not nose hooking our bait we are texas rigging our bait with a straight shanked worm hook 
This is a Gamagatsu uh, light wire worm. I also am a big fan of the of the Robo Worm Rebarb, which is a Gamagatsu with a little plastic, like, little keeper on it. Great hooks. Well, what's nice about these hooks is, is that when you get that worm rigged up, you know, a straight shanked hook, these little, these little worms want to pull down the hook. They want to pull down the hook. But look how that keeper is there, Nick. Perfect. Look how that keeper is tucked in. Look how that keeper, look how that worm's sitting on that keeper. You know, and then you just come in here and you just Texas rig. This is the magic worm from magic worm. John Cruz. And this is a, uh, it's actually a 2-0. You know, a lot of people, when they're, when they're not able to come into a nice shop like this, they have to shop online. It's really hard to get a perspective on worm sizes. This is a Gamagatsu Aaron Martin light wire. Um, you know, made for this technique. And that's actually a 2-0 worm hook, which fits that worm freaking nice. It's magic. And that new magic worm, some of those colors are just... Awesome. I mean, just like everything else they yeah. make, you know? Yeah, yes, I think... Uh, but, and, but you're drop shot in that, Mike. Yeah. I and think, you know you're going a little heavier than normal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's why I said, you know, if, if if you don't feel the bottom, you need to feel the bottom. So in this power shot and stuff, you call it power shot because you're at three-eighth. So... You're and, at three-eighth in that deeper water and quarter at the lightest. Last week at Pickwick, um, Brian Schmidt had a... Top 10 finish, I believe sixth. And uh, seventh. He ended up in seventh. Seventh. Yeah. And he spent a ton of time drop shotting a magic worm. Yeah. He did well. And he talked about the fact that he went up in weight on his weight. And there's no real benefit to having a super light weight when you're in this offshore stuff. There's actually more benefit of getting in there, you know, kicking the front door in. You know, guns, str uh, straps off the gun, safeties off, making noise, let people know you're home, shaking that worm around. Um, it really helps to, you know, draw that curiosity of that fish in there, you know. Um, braid to a leader. Yeah. Is key. Key, yeah. Because, again, deal. you got to set the hook. Now, this th these hooks are sharp. These are nano coated. These things are sharp. You're going to get a good hook set. Well, you got the structure down there. You know, you got the the, the cover. And you want to turn that fish's head and pull him out of there. Yeah. And then fight him back. To and the then boat. fight him back to the boat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's not that hard. It's it's, it's all a fantastic technique for that. Yeah. Just you know, if you're if you're anti spinning rod or you're not comfortable with this, again, you're not comfortable being offshore in the first place. So. You know, you're learning new things. Learn a bunch of them together. Yeah. George, quick question. A lot of people with this drop shot technique, they fight themselves all day with how long it should be between the hook and the weight. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do you guys think? Well, I heard, you know, some of the really good guys are, are like 6 to 12 inches, no longer than 12 inches. Or, you know, you hear a guy go, well, I don't go any longer than 18 inches. But that it's usually between 6 and 12 inches. Um. And one of the things I, I say about that is what's cool about rigging up a drop shot is, and if you use the, the weights with the little clip on them, and I did this over the weekend because I was fishing. It was very tough bite, very, very tough bite, and, I was, and we were fishing. And then really the only thing that was working was a drop shot, and it was really catching better fish. But as we cycled through our cover, I kept messing with my leader length. I'd go a little longer. I'd go a little shorter. Um, and the the sweet spot for for us was about you know, like 16 inches you know it was you didn't want to go any further than 16 inches but i messed with it down to you know i thought well okay i'm gonna mess with mine i'm gonna go down to six inches so i went down to six inches and messed with six inches but you know they they say 12 to 18 inches no longer you know now is there guys that go to longer yeah, absolutely it's like carolina rigging with a with a 24 inch leader or a seven foot leader, which they do sometimes, you know, it's just a specialty type of thing when you go real longer. But I think most people, if they stay between 12, 12 and 18 inches, you're good. 
Yeah, I generally my my rule of thumb is the shallower I'm fishing, the shorter my leader. You know, I might go a little less than twelve inches. You know, I'm 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 usually shallow water. I'm usually whatever that is, and then I'll work my way up. Um, deep water, you know, a lot of times you're actually seeing the fish up off the bottom. You can kind of get an idea. Um, but yeah, to Mike's point, that's probably the. I the asked because I've asked this question to, you know, fortunately, me, what me and George do in our business is we get to talk to all the top tier fishermen in the world. You get to talk to me every day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and when you talk to these guys, you know, you know, you're conversating about things and, and I just ask questions, you know, Hey, what, what do you do for this? What do you do for that? And I'm telling you, a lot of these guys are 12 to 18 inches and, and, you know, and they say this, yeah, I've been known to go to, you know, three, three feet for this, this type of fishing or, you know, but it doesn't always, you know, it's, it's a specialty thing, but if you stay between 12 and 18, you know, if you go 24, it's no big deal. 18, 24, it's not that, not that much difference, but that's where they say between 12 and 18. So, so I just stay between 12 and 18 because the best in the world told me that. Right, Nick? Right. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of the drop shot. Now, you know, the next thing that we need to talk about that was on our agenda, and we've talked about this technique over and over again, but we want to point it out as key for offshore fishing, and you wouldn't think it, is a Nico rig. The Nico rig is probably the biggest thing to happen to offshore fishing. Craziest damn thing in the world, You know, man. in modern times. Freaking rigs, man. They just kill me. It's it's so effective. And you remember our Nico rig show. I'm drinking the I'm drinking the Kool-Aid now on that one, Nick. I'm telling you. I love the Nico rig. I I, I am starting to drink the Kool-Aid on it. I rigged it up for like the second time in my life over the weekend. Uh, and and I put an extra heavy weight in it because I was fishing in a little deeper water and I loved it. Yeah, and the big deal with that Nico rig, if you remember from our Nico rig show, and if you haven't, please go back and review. You know, we're changing our pull point, and I'm just going to rig this worm up real quick for illustration purposes. But we're changing our pull point up the worm. So, you know, the worm is standing up. We're pulling the worm upwards with our weight down here. So it's kind of like a combo wacky rig kind of a deal. And I, I really think that, that that look is why this Nico rig is so deadly on a tough, tough offshore bite. You know, now you're going to want to go a little heavier on your weight and this is a prime example of when to go to tungsten on your nail weight just because you're getting into these big nail weights. Well, it, 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 it's easier to put to stuff them up in the worm. Well, especially when you need to go to a, a bigger weight. Eighth ounce or heavier. Yeah, you need to go to that big eighth to three sixteenth yeah. ounce weight. Tungsten's great. I mean, lead's fine. Lead's yeah. fine, but tungsten's great. I like the, uh, I like that mushroom head on the, on the, on the uh on the what on the, the z-man oh yeah the z-man you, well, the you, nut you want to talk about not never you losing the weight because yeah, the, the problem with with, with the z-man the z-man uh finesse shroom yeah. weight has that double barb on it that bad boy locks in and it was made for the bank stick yeah you know which is probably one of the best nico rig worms out there because you can't put anything else in yeah, this plastic. And the interesting thing about the bang stick is not only can you put the uh, Nico shroom weight in it real easily. Yeah, but you don't need an O ring. You know, once yeah, you, exactly. Once you put that hook in there, that ain't coming out. That's never coming out. You can catch that like a million. Not coming out. You can catch okay? a million fish on that thing. You can catch a bunch of fish on it. No O ring needed, and it floats. You got your Nico rig. You got your weight down there. This is going to stand right up for you. Yeah. The bank stick is a big deal. Big deal. The missile baits. <clears throat> That's exactly um, what I fished this weekend was the bank stick. I don't think it was a bank stick, though. I think I was throwing the. Um, 
was the other one that has that cut tail on the end? You might have been fishing a uh, a little smaller than that, four inch size. I don't know. Uh, and then the uh, the quiver for missile, you know, that kind of a worm. Yeah, doesn't really matter. I don't think the I, exact I don't worm either. matters. It's no. the fact that you're getting that that presentation. Yeah, that profile. Yeah, you know, the drop shot up off the bottom. The Nico rig standing that worm up. Yeah. You know, different levels of getting in their face. Point is, fish the Nico rig. It's a fish catching machine. Offshore. Offshore. You know, away from everything else you do, fish it offshore now. And um, the proof's in the pudding. You watch these guys do it, man. When they need a bite, they pick up the Nico rig. It's, unre it's unbelievable. We could go on and on. Uh, hula, hula stick, Philip. Thank you. Hula stick. Yeah. That's the one I was fishing over the weekend. I didn't catch anything on it, but just the fact that I was fishing it in nine foot of water and it was, I was feeling the bottom really nice on it and, and, uh, you know, and I fished it. Are you guys taking notice? Are they using, are most of the guys using O rings or not? Well, they use O rings on the, on the regular plastic. On the regular yeah. plastic. Yeah. They don't need it on Z Man. Right. They don't need it on Z Man, but they use it on regular plastic. Yeah. I like the O-ring just from a, a convenience standpoint of view. What's the pull points, right? It keep, it, you know, if you get the, these new row rings are really nice, man. You know, that uh, Mustad O-ring with the Mustad O-ring? The Nico O-ring. Nico. With the, little, oh. with, the, with the little loop on top of the big loop. Or, or Yeah, but then they have the the, the O-ring from Mustad that has the, or uh, uh, VMC. VMC that has a wacky, and then it has the Nico. The cross. Built, the cross. Yeah, built into it. That's pretty sweet. That's what yeah. I was using. That stuff's all great. Um, so, yeah, there's another technique to use in that type of situation. Those are the main techniques. Yeah, that's those what you want to do. Um, you know, you know, and we could go on and on and on and on. But like, like, like George said, you know, we wanted to highlight some of the different stuff that's like cutting edge right now. And I think we did. We I think he he did that with the with the power shaky um, uh, technique that with the big with the big uh, worms. Um, and I think he's done that with the fact that you're going to use the Texas rig on your drop shot with a heavy weight for, for, for getting to that. And the last thing we like to run through to fire them up again is the big swim bait. So not a huge swim bait, you know, five to six inches. This is a mega bass freestyle. Um, what do they call it a thing? They call it the freestyle mag draft. Okay. So if you're fishing over hard spots, we like to fish it on a on a jig head. So you're gonna have a you know a three quarter ounce, you know, pretty pretty decent sized jig head. This is dirty jig. Um tactical bass head. If you're fishing it in in the in the nasties, we like the big weighted belly hook. Seven and eight O. This is a uh, Gamagatsu. We also like the uh, big owner, the eight O. This is seven O three eighth ounce Gamagatsu. Works great on this size bait. Yeah, uh, because they have a cavity. This is a fantastic technique. Again, two, three, four casts through the area. If there's an active fish, you're going to catch them. That's it. Yeah. Um. Uh, so and and there's multiple other techniques that we're not going to talk about today because of time. But these are like our wheelhouse techniques that we've learned from the best in the business. So there you go, guys. I think you got it. I think uh, hopefully, you know, we we showed you a couple tricks of the trade. Hopefully we gave you some confidence in finding the structure, working with the structure, uh, uh, is isolating out the better spots on the structure. I, 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 I hope I hope it gives you a little bit of confidence for the guys that don't do it much. Um, you need to you need to really really work on that and this is the best time to start right now and it just gets better through july and it gets better through through august um so i hope that really helps out um so what do we got next george we got some some tournament talk here or? no no tournament talk got? today i do have some interesting uh information now all right interesting yeah. information yeah never heard that topic before yeah, pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I didn't have time to get any tournament talk together this week. Well, we we can say this at least. Our man GDP 
and that's Gregory De Palma. He had a fantastic tournament. Pickwick. On Pickwick. And on Fork. And on Fork. But Two Pickwick. back-to-back, but the I late... I believe he was latest, 11th on Pickwick. Uh, he was... He got... On Pickwick, he got 12th. 12th, 12th yeah, yeah, 12th. Yeah. 12th place on uh, on Pickwick. Great Time tournament. Uh, did really well. Man, awesome. We, we were so excited. We thought we, thought we were going to be flying down there for the top 10. Um, but congratulations, Greg, for doing that. That was a great tournament for you. And, of course, it's, I think he had a lot to do with drop shot. I think he was drop shotting a lot. He's a drop shot hammer. You know Yeah, that. I mean, a lot of what we talked about tonight. Yeah. Was that tournament? That, that it was that tournament. You know the yep. crankbait. The crankbait played. Kind of brought the topic up, and then we always use these tournaments to bring topics. You know, relevant topics, and um, that was that was kind of where that this whole offshore structure thing came from. They were fishing a lot of ledges, a lot of humps. Oh, well, you can see that crankbait. That crankbait played. Yeah. The the drop shot played. Yeah. The Nico rig played. The swim bait played. What do you got there, George? What stuff do you got to talk about? Well, I want to talk about Logan Kerman. Mm. Logan. That's a familiar name. Yeah, he comes in the shop here. Yep. He just set the Maryland Chesapeake Bay state record for common carp. You know that name, don't you, Brian? Yep. He, yep. he was pre-fishing for the Ike tournament on the Susquehanna Flats. With a spinning rod and a little worm, and he went and caught a forty-nine pound common carp. <laughs> the, the picture is hysterical, man. Oh, this... you know what's even more hysterical? He put that big bugger in his live well of his Phoenix <laughs> and drove it into Northeast Maryland to Herb's tackle and had it officially had it officially weighed and then released it. Holy hell! The thing is gigantic. You know. It's funny to me that I don't know how long it was, but the girth was almost as long as the length of this thing. Looked like he was, uh, you know, Kevin Costner in the in the <laughs> in the movie, you know, Cowboys, where he was rescuing a calf in a in a blizzard. Yeah, right. it, it looks like the calf that it was did. across the it's, saddle. It's know? a great picture. Look online; you guys can find that. Around what 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 a great what a great picture. The record he broke stood since 1978. God almighty. 49 pound common carp. I can know I didn't know what he was doing out there with night crawlers. No, 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 no. Huh? That's plastic what he, worm. Oh, he did catch on yeah. a plastic worm? Oh, okay. Plastico. I thought he said I thought he said uh, night crawlers in the article. No. No, you misread, sir. Hmm. Night crawler. So plastic. Logan, we saw Logan down there last well, week, too. All right. Bumped into Logan uh, down there fishing, and I bumped, hard. I bumped into him at the at the uh, uh, at the Ike, but I didn't know he caught that fish at the Ike. I just kind of waved to him, and I got two words for Logan: Carpe Diem. <laughs> yeah, and clean your live well out. <laughs> <laughs> Wash your live well down. Great guys, great guys. They come up here to the shop. Plus, they fish a lot of. Uh, they fish the Conowinga series. So if you guys see him at the Conowinga series. They're hardcore. Uh, give them a give them a high five for that big old. They're like all the record. viewers of Tackle Shop Live. Hardcore. Hardcore. Yep. So listen, I got a warning for everybody. Yep. You know, we all dream of owning a boat. We all work so hard to own a boat. We're always working on our boat. We're maybe upgrading our boat. It's all about the boat. You can't be, you can't be a bassin machine like we all are without a boat. E15, which is a popular choice at the pump <laughs> because of uh, at the pump. <laughs> certain uh, geopolitical issues, which we will not entertain tonight, <laughs> will absolutely jack your stuff up. So when you are filling up your boat, make for damn sure that you are reading the pump handle. And it does not say E15. It should say E10, not E15. If you put that E15 in your prized bass in machine power plant, you will be on the bank fishing for carp. Trying, trying to break, to break the record. Logan's record. Because 
as they say, <laughs> yo shit gonna be your messed shit's up. gonna be messed up. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh hell, that's funny. Yeah, and the last PSA that I have for you. PSA. Public service announcement. Mm. Get with the programs. There you go. It's driving me crazy here. You're good. I just want to get. You're good. I just want to get home. Just talk. Shimano has re uh, tweaked. They've tweaked and re released the Sedona. Remember when they first brought the Sedona out? Wait a second. From when? Uh, from that- 2020. One. This is new. This is new for 2022. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Remember back in the day when yeah. they first brought the Sedona out? Oh, the Sedona has that, always that, been. I mean, that was like yeah. that was in the 80s. Remember yeah. the song? Yeah. My Sedona. My Sedona. My Sedona. Yeah, that's when they first brought it out. This is like the. This is A, B, C, D. This is like the fifth generation, right? So here's what's cool about this. $74.99. Yeah. Okay, we're not talking about these high-end, you know, pimp daddy reels. $74.99. Three ball bearing, one roller bearing. The 2500 and the 3000 bring in 36 inches of line per crank at a 6 2 to 1 gear ratio. And these bad boys scale in at 6.9 or 6.8.6 ounces. Damn. They're not too heavy. They, they lighten them up. They're nice. They put a better handle on them. Beautiful. They put a better gear in them. They have the, they have the cold forge gear that the higher end reels have. Unbelievable. Uh listen, $74.99. We just got some. The twenty five hundred, the three thousand, and the four thousand are all six two to one ratio. Mm-hmm. Uh anytime you see in a uh Shimano spinning reel or casting reel. The price reel, is what gets me on that, George. It's a hell of a reel for the price. And you know, you know who else likes that? The saltwater guys. Because it's all uh, stainless steel shielded bearings, the stainless steel main shaft, and they are not afraid to take out the salt water, and it holds up well in the salt water. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, the other thing I did last weekend was I fished the Macbeth wake bait. That's right, people. I'm out there learning and earning for you. I threw the fire out of this thing. This is a true wake bait. They, there's no mistaking the fact that this bad boy wakes. We've got some great hooks. We've got some great colors. We've got a great profile for like a shed, early season shed, you know, the first generation of shed, small bait fish. This thing is bad to the bone. Cast great. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, that review brought to you by... Uh, George on the water. You can catch George on the water most Sundays. Um, Nick. Yes. Me and, oh, me that, and you. Me and you are hat. sporting a new hat. It's awesome. Zoom in on it on that logo there. This is a cool hat. This is the American flag, and the stars are um, America. The stars are fish. Smallmouth. And the. Uh, the stripes are lures, and it's a cool hat. And plus, on this side, it's, it has our. We got a SFT tackle.com hit on the side. Yeah, and it comes, has the SFT logo on the side there. We do the charcoal and yeah. white. Charcoal and white has the. Uh, Red, white, and blue on it. Black has the leather patch. Charcoal and white has the. There's the cloth SFT patch. 
on the side, rolling the colors. There's the colors. Patriotic. Patriotic here. We're patriots. Absolutely. In stock now. They're not on the website, but you can you can call us up and get one. It's a great hat. And it's and the nice thing about it, it's uh is that flex fit? No. No. Just a nice hat. So snapback trucker. The black one is a flex fit. Yeah, the black one is a flex fit. This is a snapback trucker. Yeah, this is a standard snapback trucker. Outdoor this, cap. This is your flex fit, Nick. So you, you got the substandard one, Nick. I'm loving this one now. I know. Love it's it. great. I got the flex fit, which I really like. It fits real well. Okay. You got anything else, George? Got anything, Nick? I can go on for days, boys, but I'm going to call it a night. What do you got, Nick? I'm good. I just hope everybody catches on this week and let us know. Uh, Nick, you're, you're selling your boat. I'm selling my boat. Yeah. And uh, if somebody wants Nick's boat, you better hurry up and call him. But he has somebody coming Sunday to look at it. From Smith Mountain Lake. Yeah, so this he's is a pretty serious buyer. Oh, yeah. He's real serious. So you can check Nick after Sunday. Whoa, 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 whoa. Huh. The boat ain't sold yet. Guy's coming on Sunday. No, no, no. He's coming Today's Thursday. You wouldn't sell it underneath. You can go underneath. buy Nick's boat tomorrow. I, I just did. Yeah. I he would, guy, Nick wouldn't know. do it. He'd say he'd hold it till then. Good yeah. thing it ain't my boat. <laughs> first come, first serve. Show me the money, baby. <laughs> no, I figured if he's coming from Smith Mount Lake, he's, he's pretty, pretty serious yeah, about serious it. Yeah. 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 yeah, you know. So Nick's selling his boat. He's going to Skeeter. Well, I'm going to yeah go with my dad's boat for a while. Skeeter. You're going to run your dad's boat yep. for a while, run a Skeeter. Yep. Go from there. You probably never. You're probably never going to leave there. I, I tell you once, what, I like once you start running listen, skeeters, man, it's it's over. I don't want to start any kind of bass boat war out there, but mm. you start running them skeeters, dude. It's over. <laughs> it's over, huh? It's over. Although I was in a really nice, a really nice uh, Phoenix over the weekend. A twenty. I don't know what it was. Twenty-one footer. Twenty-nine foot. 20.9. Freaking nice. Oh, yeah, they're nice. I mean, we were we were we were running some pretty heavy chop, and it was like my back was like no problem. It was awesome. It was really awesome. So I don't know, Nick. You got to bounce around on that one. Yeah, you know what? At the end of the day, you just gotta go fishing. Well, at the end of the day, if you're standing on any kind of platform like that, yeah, you're blessed. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're blessed as hell just to stand on any kind of platform like that. So mm -hmm. Well, if you put E15 in your tank, your platform's going to be fine, but your go go is not going to work too good. <laughs> Don't put E15 in there. Hey, you got to save money somehow, right, George? All I'm just right, everybody. You know. We really appreciate you stopping by tonight. And as always, um, you know, check out our Facebook, our Instagram, our TikTok, our YouTube. Uh, we're putting, a, we're putting, a, I got a new GoPro, pro, Nick. How'd that work out for you? It, well, you know, it was a learning curve. So I, I was running it all day long and, and uh, trying to figure out if I had enough battery and if I, or not battery, but uh, card info. So, and then I brought it home. Kate made a little small video. She put it out there, but uh, she's working on some new stuff and we just kind of were learning with it. But I'm, that sucker is running all the time from here on out. Did it, mm. did it run all day? Ran what? all day. Nice. Stick, I got a Yoli stick, a YOLO. Yellow stick. Yellow yeah. stick. But I mean, did the did the memory card last all day? No, I, I turned it off a couple times because I was worried that it was filling up too yeah. much. Because I, I only had a two two fifty six, and uh, but I got the big boy card coming now. I can run that sucker all oh, nice. day long. Mm. And uh, so you know, you gotta you gotta be careful though, Nick. You know, uh, uh, when you're out fishing, you gotta relieve yourself. You know, you gotta you gotta remember. Especially when your daughter's doing the editing, you kind of remember to hit the button. Well, unless you got the telephoto <laughs> lens, I don't think you have to worry. <laughs> Shit, George. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got, you got to hit the button. I just got, I just got to remember to hit the button. So that was that was an embarrassing. Just saying. That's a good story, though. Yeah, that was a good story. But anyway, you know, we're, uh, you know, so we're, we we got this video, this raw video that we're going to have all the time from here on out. And then as we're going, it's easy just to turn around and explain something that's going on. Right. So, um, as again, we're a teaching shop. We're learning all the time. And as we learn stuff, we want to teach it and push it along. And this is going to really help us with that. And this, that, this, uh, uh, she's still here. Laughing. 
uh, and it just helps really with uh, the learning process of when you get video involved there. So, and we need our, our listeners and viewers to do us a favor here. Um, you know, social media is geared by, uh, you know, the different, what do you call them? Uh, they, they change in all the time. So we need the algorithms. the algorithms. We need you to not only view our stuff, which yeah. we know you do. Yeah. We need you to comment. We need you to like. Yeah. It and helps. if you really find it good, please share it. Yeah. And it really helps us and it, and it, and it tells us we need to keep doing that. Keep doing that. Yeah. Right. And we follow you guys all the time. And we were, we're always, we're always checking out what you guys are doing. And uh, we're always, you know, listening to your comments and we're always watching your comments. And if you have, if you want us to jump on something, do something different, we'll do it. Uh, just let us know. You know, it's a good way of, of uh, communicating. All right. Well, thank you guys for stopping by. And, um, uh, you know, we will see you at the next Tackle Shop Live. Forty-nine pound carp. <laughs> that's what I was saying, man. That is crazy. Forty-nine pound carp. It's like that's a giant. Man. He should be getting a hold of Phoenix. Hey, your your boat can hold a forty-nine pound carp. You see the picture that time? No music. No music. What the hell, no music. No music. This fucking thing here. Piece of shit. Not working again. Okay, and this pretty quick. It, it's not like it has its own mind, okay? It doesn't decide to play music and then not play music. It's just so screwed up. It's either right or it's not right. I vote for not right. <laughs> I got a hard not right. I, I, Kate's right. trying to tell me that she can hear us. Can you hear us, Kate? Must be this thing. You would think that in. in